All right, forensic students, we are starting on our blood evidence section um, of forensic evidence, which is unit two, and we're going to cover blood in a couple different lessons. So today, specifically, we're going to focus on forensic serology and then a division of forensic serology, which is going to be blood typing. We're going to talk a little bit about blood typing and how it can be applied to forensics. Um, and then in future lessons, we're going to move more into the physics of blood and how it moves and how it travels. Um, and that's going to be in our blood spatter lessons. So before we jump into blood typing, you need to know that there is a branch of forensic investigation that is the heart of crime solving, even more so than fingerprints or hair analysis or fiber analysis, and that is forensic serology. So forensic serology, when combined with the incredible science of DNA analysis, it can provide the indisputable piece of evidence that places a suspect at the scene of a crime and ultimately puts them behind bars. Um, it is a hardcore science, and it is the hardcore science behind thousands of real-life cold cases that have been solved. And so it is extremely important to talk about. We do not need to overlook forensic serology. And if you're looking for a definition, um, I've got one on the screen. Might be a good idea to write this down. So serology in general is just a term that's used to describe really a broad range of laboratory tests uh, that uses chemical reactions between blood serum and other bodily fluids and then reagents. So we're going to talk about some of those chemical reactions today. Now, a serology lab uh, is going to cover a lot of different areas, and I've listed some of those areas on the screen. So you can have a foren forensic serology center or forensic serology lab, and within that laboratory, there's going to be different divisions. So you can have an area that specializes in blood typing, um, an area of that laboratory that characterizes unknown blood, um, an area that looks specifically at spatter patterns or blood stain um, patterns and do they, they do an analysis or crime scene reconstruction. Um, you can have a division for paternity testing and then semen identification in rape cases. Um, and then of course you can have just strictly DNA identification. All right, so there are three different questions that has to be answered by a forensic investigator when they're working a crime scene and they have found something that they believe could be blood. So the first question a crime scene investigator is going to ask is, is this actually blood? Um, and they're not going to have time to swap that sample and send it off and wait days or weeks or months for those test results to come back. So an investigator is going to have a ready to go on the scene test that they can use to test to determine if something is indeed blood or not. They call these tests presumptive blood tests and you can see on the screen there's different um, versions of these tests. But again, a presumptive blood test is an on the scene qualitative analysis that just identifies or confirms the presence or absence of a substance in a sample. So usually these presumptive blood tests use a chemical reaction to identify a positive result. So you can see one of the presumptive blood tests that are often used by investigators is something known as the Castlemayer test. Um, and this is a chemical or Castlemayer reagent is a chemical indicator um, specifically phenolphthalein that reacts with hemoglobin in blood, um, if it detects that hemoglobin, hemoglobin, it will indicate the presence of blood by turning a bright like magenta color or like a really bright pink color. And I've got a picture of that in like the next couple of slides, I'll show you that. Um, you can also have a presumptive blood test like luminol. This is one that you, if you've watched shows like CSI or Criminal Minds, you've probably seen the investigators use something like luminol. Um, but again, luminol works the same way. It is a reagent that's just added to what investigators believe to be blood. And through chemical analysis, it will indicate the presence of blood or not. 
Specifically, luminol can be added to latent blood stains. Those are stains that um, can't be seen with the naked eye. And they, the luminol will actually bioluminesce or glow um, if there is, if it detects blood. Um, so it is great for blood stains that have been cleaned. So if somebody's cleaned a crime scene um, to try to make blood disappear, luminol can detect that blood. Now, the second question that's going to be asked by investigators, after they confirm that they have blood, they're going to want to confirm that they have actual human blood, and then they're going to want to sample that blood, send it off for DNA analysis, um, and then they might also use it for blood typing purposes, which we'll also talk about today. All right, so this is just an example of the luminol test, um, which again is a presumptive blood test. It's on the can be done on the scene. You don't have to wait days or weeks for the results to come back. Um, and you just need to know that blood contains or red blood cells contain hemoglobin and iron. And the iron um, is actually what reacts with the luminol. And with a UV light, it can be made to glow. Um, and so you can see that in the picture here. This is an example of the Castlemayer test. You can see in this picture, the uh, lab tech is just swabbing what she believes may contain human blood. Um, and then she puts it through a series of three reagents. And then if it does test positive for blood, it's gonna glow this, um, or turn this bright pink color. You can see on the screen, it's a beautiful color, um, but that does indicate the presence of blood. All right, so blood, if found at a crime scene, can be valuable in a couple of different ways. We know, because we've talked about DNA, that you can collect DNA from blood. So of course, the blood's gonna be swabbed and sent off for DNA analysis. Um, and that's gonna be helpful, but that, that takes a while. Um, to, to get those reports back. So investigators may need to eliminate suspects or confirm that blood at a crime scene is probably the victim's blood or could be the victim's blood or is not the victim's blood. So they may want to do a blood typing um, test and that would, again, could be on the scene. So blood typing is often used not to identify a suspect because remember blood typing is a form of class evidence so it's not going to narrow down the suspect field to a single person but it can narrow the suspect field which could be helpful in helping to eliminate suspects or eliminate the victim as a donor of a blood stain at a crime scene it's much cheaper much less time consuming than dna profiling so if you were if you were one of my students, we've done a little bit of research over blood typing. Um, but just just to kind of recap, there are four different blood types. Actually, there's eight if we're talking about the rhesus factor um, or the Rh factor. So you can have A, B, A, B, or O. And then if we factor in the positive, negative, you can have A positive blood, A negative blood, B positive, B negative, A B positive, A B negative. O positive or O negative. Okay, so eight different blood types. All right, so that ends today's lesson. I'm going to leave this on the screen so that you can take a look at it um, because I often get a lot of questions about who can donate blood if you are AB positive, who can um, accept your blood or receive your blood. If you are B negative, can you donate blood? And so this kind of helps answer some of those questions. So take a look at this. Also, if you are not clear on blood typing and you want some more information, let me show you a really good website. Let me see. All right, so if you'll go to YouTube and type in what are blood types, um, the SciShow Show has a really good informative video over the different blood types and how we can determine our own blood type. Um, so definitely check that out if you're interested.